Okay, well, look, a very warm welcome to everybody. We've got 29 people on the call. Um, there may be one or two still to come in, but I think we should get underway. I don't like keeping people waiting. Um, so my name is Andrew Thin, um, Chairman of the Land Commission, and a, a warm welcome to this. We, we used to hold public meetings in village halls all over the place, and that was great, but we then went during the pandemic, went to doing it online, and actually found that doing it online, we, we were able to uh involve people who, who who simply couldn't make it to a village hall so so we're, we're for the moment anyway we're sticking with mainly doing it online it seems to work quite well and 29 people no it's up to 31 now that's great so thank you all very very much for joining us before we go any further i'm going to introduce the people from the land commissioner here so i've introduced myself already andrew Zinn. i'm chairman of the land commission i live in inverness um and actually by the look of the names that are popping up on the screen know quite a lot of you already um, but let's just go around the other people who are here from the Land Commission. So, Lauren, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Yes, uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Lauren McLeod, and I'm based in Oban. Uh, prior to becoming a Land Commissioner, I was Chairman of Community Land Scotland, which is the representative body for community landowners in Scotland. And uh, I've been involved with the uh, land reform in various parts. Uh, for up to uh, 30 years now. So really looking forward to this evening and the discussion and debate that will follow the presentation. Thanks then, Andrew. Thanks, Lauren, very much indeed. And uh, Hamish, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Hello, I'm, I'm Hamish Trench, uh, Chief Executive of the Scottish Land Commission. So I lead the staff team. We've got a, a small staff team of around 16 people, most of whom are based uh, around Inverness. Uh, and uh, I live in Grand Town, so good to have a local focus tonight, even if we are online. So, Amish, well, I know the King goes pretty well. We all know the King goes pretty well, actually. <laughs> Great. And Karen, Karen, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Hello, I'm Karen, and I'm one of the Good Practice Advisors at the Commission. I'm based in Forest, and my background, uh, uh, my recent background, is um, working on the family farm and for Reforesting Scotland's Thousand Huts campaign before I joined the Commission in November. Brilliant. Thanks, Karen, very much indeed. And also, but you can't see her, is uh, also with us is Sarah. And Sarah is the genius that uh, organises all the tech stuff and the, the the, the overheads and all the rest of it uh, that we're using uh, and she'll keep us all right and if things go disastrously wrong Sarah will fix it but, but more I mean if things go totally wrong um, uh, we, we, we obviously we'll have to reconvene but it's never happened so far and I don't expect it a quick touch with here but I don't expect that to happen either. Um, okay so why do we do this first of all um, just you know, right from the start, we were established just at the end of 2016, beginning of 17, really. Um, and from the start, we said, look, we're, we're going to be a slightly unusual public body in that the board is going to be out in a village hall somewhere in Scotland every month. And Lord and I in particular, but other, other board members too, have been round and round the country, out to the islands and all the rest of it, away down to, to Gretna Green and away up to Lowick. So we've been around. And, and then the pandemic came along, so we moved it online, as I said. But we do this, and right from the start, we have done this, because the, the Commission is set up to advise government and parliament and, and others on land and land reform. And that's a huge subject. So we had to understand what people's priorities were. And that, so these public meetings have shaped the priorities of the Commission from the off. And the first three-year plan was very much shaped by uh, us tramping around in the spring of 2017 and then the second uh, three-year plan which we're still working on was shaped by these public meetings and the next uh, three-year plan will also be shaped by these public meetings and that's that, that's something we'll actually be working on next year from the end of this year really so they're hugely important um and they are in the 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 the, the format um I will do a very brief presentation, but it will be brief. I, I think it's you know, obviously people come to these meetings with very different understandings of what we are about. Some people will know all about what we do. Some people won't have a clue, they'll just be inquisitive. Um, so I'll do a wee presentation just to kind of set the scene and help people get onto roughly the same place, um, but it will be brief. What we, these meetings are conversations. That's what we want them to be. They're conversations with, 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 with all of the people on this call um, and, of course, if you've got questions to ask us, ask us questions. 
But what I want to hear in particular is what are your views? What are your thoughts? What are your priorities for land reform? Um, there, there is so much to it's such a huge subject. We're a very small organization, as Hamish has just said, just, just over a dozen staff. What, what are the priorities for, for, for the future uh, for land reform? Um, so that's what we'll do. Um, we will finish uh, no later than 8.30, I promise you that. So that's, uh, that's what we said we would do, and that's what we'll do. It's not fair to let these things drift on. So we will finish no later than 8.30. Um, and I think without any further ado, I'm just going to launch into the presentation and hope that I manage to make the technology work. So let's get started. So what is, first of all, I think it is worth just being clear what land reform is, because it is a huge subject. And um, I think everybody in Scotland knows that land reform is something to do with the fact that we have one of the most concentrated patterns of land ownership in Europe, if not in the world. 400 people own over half of Scotland. Um, so a lot of people know that, and that is certainly a big issue and will be the subject of a land reform bill next year, a land reform bill in Parliament next year. So that's been a big area of work for us. But, it, and it's also, I think most people know that it's, that it's something to do with the relationship between landlords and tenants, whether they're tenant farmers or indeed crofters, although there is a crofting commission to deal with crofting issues. Um, and the last round of land reform in, in 2016 majored on the whole issue of relationships between landlords and tenants. Um, but it's actually about an awful lot more than that. And, it, and, and, and here's just a flavour of a few other things that, that, that we've either looked at or hope to look at. Big issue now in Scotland is the role of land in carbon sequestration and natural capital more generally, wind, water, rewilding, all these things. Um, and we've we've seen um, extraordinary rises in land values in the last year or two in Scotland on the back of people coming in buying land for purposes very non-traditional purposes you know people used to buy land in order to, <coughs> to shoot stags or grow food or grow trees or whatever but increasingly it's for all sorts of other things um, so dealing with that and dealing with managing the consequences of that, many of you will know, for example, that there have been some big corporate buyers buying areas of land in the national park for natural capital purposes of one sort or another, carbon sequestration mainly. Dealing with that is a land reform issue, no question. Another area which we actually identified very early on, it came back from public meeting after public meeting, especially in central Scotland, is vacant and derelict land. That, as it happens, is a vacant building in the National Park, but there are huge areas of derelict and vacant uh, land and buildings all over Scotland, particularly um, around Glasgow, that uh, are, are, are simply blights, frankly. They're blights on local communities, they're blights on the economy, they're blights on the landscape. Um, and we need to deal with that. So that's been a big land reform issue for us. Um, the whole question of, so, so, so how is Scotland going to use our land? I mean, land's a finite thing. And, you know, at its most basic, this land belongs to the people of Scotland. Of course, they're landowners and they have rights and all the rest of it. But this is, this is our land. How do we as a society, as a nation, want to plan and, and, and the, the, the use of our land. And we've done some work on that and we'll happily talk about that. Um, another well-known area of land reform from 2003, four actually, one of the early land reform acts was responsible public access. And that's actually Loch Inch where some, some very early legal precedents were set in relation to public access to water. So it's quite a sort of topical photograph. Um, and, and obviously, you know, the, the, the responsible right of access is hugely important to the national park and the economy of the national park. And although Nature Scott leads on that, it is a land reform issue. Um, community ownership, Lauren mentioned that, and, and there's been a huge, since I was probably involved quite early on, since the early 90s, I guess, 90s, probably 90s, two, three, there's been a wave of community acquisitions and communities have become empowered and and, and really some extraordinary things have happened. Something like 70% of the Western Isles is now community owned. But increasingly what we're seeing is really quite targeted community acquisitions, not just of land, but of buildings. And that uh, the photograph just makes the point that in Fort Rose, just down the road from me, the community bought the public toilets because they got fed up with what the council was doing and they thought they could do a better job. Um, communities have bought cinemas. There's even a community that's bought a bridge. 
and it's extraordinary what's happening. Communities are building affordable housing themselves. They've decided that they can do it better than other people. Um, and 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 yes, communities are buying land in the traditional sense uh, for for amenity, for recreation, and so on. But there's there's a, been a an extraordinary explosion of community led acquisition, ownership, and empowerment across Scotland. Very important. And traditionally, a, a traditional area for land reform going certainly going back to the first world war was the creation of of sort of small holdings of one sort or another that as it happens that picture is of my granny's hut my granny was a hutter um but uh, and the hutting movement which is now not much talked about was a very important land reform movement between the wars when people acquired really often on very very tenuous leases, little bits to places to put their huts, and a lot of them were evicted later on, including, I have to say, my granny. It's a slightly sore point. So, so that's another area, the whole business of how do we diversify ownership of, of land in Scotland? How do we enable people who, who probably don't want a thousand acres, they probably want 10 acres or an acre. How do we do that? And then there's more sort of complicated stuff, but still hugely important. Landowner said to me a few years ago, I said to him, why do you come to Scotland to own land? He was from abroad. Um, and he said, I, I, I come here because um, I can do things here I, I can't do in my own country. Um, and part of that was the, 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 to do with the tax regime. And, 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 and many, actually many UK landowners will tell you that one of the reasons they own land is because the tax, it, it enables them to shelter, um, not in an illegal way, perfectly legal, but it enables them to shelter wealth from taxation. So tax is important, but tax also can be used to incentivize land use and incentivize land reform. So we've done quite a bit of work on that. And the last picture, which admittedly is flippant, but I just I do want to make the point land reform is a long term process. We've been doing it for well over a century, probably a couple of hundred years in Scotland. Some of the early crofting acts were land reform and, and were seen as highly radical. Um, and it's it's incremental. It will go on. I think, we'll, you know, we, we, we'll go on adapting um, uh, over over years to come and generations to come, because essentially what we're doing is is adapting laws and policy and practice to to present day circumstances and present day expectations. But we have to be careful because you can get things wrong. You can do things do things wrong, and that's really why we have a land commission. And and we were created by Parliament in in two thousand and uh, well, it's the two thousand sixteen Act, but it was established in two thousand seventeen. And our job is to provide advice and recommendations on changes to law. So that's clearly we're advising parliament and government and that sort of thing on policy, which may well be government, or it, but it could be others, but on, on cultural shifts and on changes in practice as well, which is us advising as often as not landowners. And, and that could be big public landowners or private landowners or, or charities like the RSVB. So, we, so we've, you know, we've got potentially, we could be advising all sorts of people, but it's the focus is land, land reform. We're a national organisation and fundamentally we are about making the most of Scotland's land for all of Scotland's people. It, it, it's, it's pretty straightforward. It's just, this is not about ideology or any other nonsense. It's about making sure that the Scottish people as a whole, and I do underline that, as a whole can benefit as much as possible from the land resources of Scotland. We are a very wee organisation, Hamish is right. You know, it's 10, 12, 15 people, it depends how you count part-time roles and so on, it's not big at all. <clears throat> it's a national remit, so we don't have people sort of on the ground in the national park holding people's hands on specific issues and so on, that's for others to do. But we have done, since we were established, we published a huge amount of advice. <clears throat> it's all there on, on the website and um, uh, we, we you know, we place a very high value on transparency, so we publish everything very publicly. There's, not, there's no advice that we give in secret. Uh, it's all there. The fundamental concept that was established in 2017 and which underpins, I think, everything we do is this idea that if you are going to own and enjoy land rights, then you also have responsibilities. You can't separate those two. Um, that's just a photograph of, a, of the chapter heading at the beginning of the Land Reform Act in 2016. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's actually quite a simple concept if you think about it, that with land rights go responsibilities. The two are, are inseparable. And it's actually very closely mirrors a much, much older concept that with privilege goes obligation. 
and it's not a new it's not really a new idea but but all of our work in a way builds on that fundamental concept and it's a very important concept and i should also be clear though, though of course most land rights are owned by land owners and so they own most of the responsibilities as well tenants also have land rights and responsibilities and we as members of the public if we're out there exercising a right of responsible access have a right and a responsibility so it's not just about owners in the three-year plan we're currently working on which was based on what people said to us in all these public meetings in 2018-19 um, there are three headings we are and have been publishing information on reforming the rights that underpin all this, the actual land rights. We have been doing a huge amount of work on what does responsible look like, so that if you have these rights, how will, we, how will you know and how will we know that you are fulfilling your responsibilities? And thirdly, we're doing quite a lot of work on the way, on land markets, the way in which land is bought and sold and changes hands and so on. So a wee bit on each and first on reforming land rights. <clears throat> so the obje our objective from this work is, is, is really fairly straightforward. It is to encourage a more diverse pattern of ownership and tenure in Scotland to reduce the concentration. Um, and it, it doesn't, it's not just about ownership. It is, I emphasize, about tenure. So we want to, you know, we want to see more um tenanted land um could be crofting it could be could be agricultural tenure um, and different kinds of tenure you know um contract arrangements share share shared ownership these sorts of things so we're also doing work on new ownership models and new governance models that would actually widen the way in which people can engage with and have a degree of rights over that land if you go to other parts of europe huge swathes of land will actually have a raft of people holding rights in that piece of land different rights, rights to grow trees, rights to take fish, rights to raise their sheep, rights to have a hut, <laughs> whatever else. Um, it, that kind of multi-layered ownership, multi-layered governance is much more common than elsewhere in Europe. In this country, it tends to be focused on one owner. And part of this work, the hu human rights, the European Convention on Human Rights and the Human Rights Act in the UK that translates that into UK law, protects people's right to the peaceful enjoyment of their property. But it doesn't, it's not an absolute right. It can, it, 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 it must, it can be interfered with, so to speak, if it is in the public interest to do so. And that's quite a difficult balancing act for any government to, to get right. So uh, we, we, we are <coughs> still doing actually quite a bit of work on this and um, trying to help government find that that right balance, that fair balance, that appropriate balance between the human rights of the individual owner on the one hand, with the wider rights of, of society, social and cultural rights, difficult areas. And a particular, probably the most high profile area of work under this heading has been our work on concentrated land ownership. I'm not gonna talk a lot about it now, happy to talk in the discussion, but fundamentally, what we concluded from that was that we needed to focus on, on, on power. That, that is, it's not have you got a thousand acres or a thousand and five acres or five thousand or five thousand and ten. It is, is power concentrated. So clearly, if one person owns an entire island, they're in a pretty powerful position over the community decisions relating to community on that island. So that's a monopoly. Similarly, if someone owns all the land between Aviemore and Glenmore, <laughs> that's pretty concentrated. Um, and puts a lot of power in one set of hands. So it, 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 is, an, it is about power, and we, we've drawn in the work on parallels elsewhere where, where society seeks to, to regulate monopolies in banking, in shopping, in, 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 in power, and various other areas. I'm happy to talk further about that if you want to. And the second area is, accountability and responsibility. As I said, you can't have land rights without also having responsibilities. And so this whole program, which we've called Good Practice Program, is based on this idea that, it, that you, you must fulfill responsibilities if you're going to have rights. And it's up to what we're trying to do is to spell out, so what, what does responsible look like? We're publishing loads of protocols and tools and guidance, and, and, and I, I suspect over the next few years we're going to do a whole heap more work in this area, um, spelling out 
basically producing a script, if you like, for the owners of land rights. If you if you own land rights, here's what you have to do to fulfill your responsibilities and spelling it out. And we're working away with owners and communities and all the rest of it to help them get this right. And it's a it's a for, for some it's a challenging process. Let's not not pretend otherwise. It's it's it, for some for some owners it's a challenging idea. But I have to say that my experience is that actually most owners of land rights have welcomed this and said, we absolutely accept we've got responsibilities and we absolutely accept that it'd be really helpful if you would spell out what good looks like. So that's what we're doing. Um, the Tenant Farming Commissioner is a particular aspect of this um, because, you know, again, clearly what, what, what does good look like if you're a land a land ten, landlord of tenanted land, you have rights and therefore you have responsibilities. And if you're a tenant, you have rights and responsibilities. So the Tenant Farming Commissioner, who's a member of the Land Commission Board, is Bob McIntosh, but he's, only, but he's one person. He, with a bit of help from uh, really excellent staff, has put together codes of practice, spelling out what good's like, good looks like. And there's some legal underpinning here, which we haven't at the moment got for our wider work. May, it may come. He's also done a lot of work on mediation to try and reduce disagreements between landlords and tenants, and he's been very successful. And he's doing some really interesting work, actually, on, on new entrants and, and trying to find ways in which um, we, we can, we can we can set up systems that would would, would enable um, land to be released to new entrants, whether on a tenancy or ownership or contract or, or, or joint venture or anything else. But it's all part of this trying to diversify ownership and tenure. Um, and lastly, on this one, hugely important that we communicate what good looks like. It's all very well producing guidance and, and figuring out and defining what good looks like but if we don't tell people it's not much use and so a huge amount to work on on blogs and webinars all this kind of stuff and 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 some great people like can out on the ground as well helping people within within the limits of what we can do and that picture is just a, a recent blog actually from the end of april by a lady at the national farmers union who who, who was explaining talking about her experience of, of, of farmers and fulfilling responsibilities that go with, with their land rights, because this is not just about bigger owners at all, of course. So very important. And lastly, on reforming land markets. So very early on, people said to us at these public meetings, we really, you really need to do something about vacant and derelict land. It's sitting there, people are speculating, people are, are sitting there for 20 years doing nothing, it's a blight, all this sort of stuff. So that is an area that we've worked really hard at. We've made a lot of progress. I think, I think that is beginning to shift now. There's still more work to be done. For example, we recommended that there should be a, a, a tool available to local authorities called a compulsory sale order, where if land was left vacant and derelict, the local authority could move, move in and force the sale of that land at auction. That's not in place yet, but it may well be. But that work has already been very effective. And we're seeing a lot of, of vacant derelict land coming into use that previously lay around. Um, housing is, is just such a massive issue in the National Park and such a massive issue actually for the whole of Scotland but sometimes I find myself just tearing my hair out over it but we did uh, complete quite recently a really major piece of work and research involving some really very clever economists and all the rest of it and, and in essence I, I'm not going to go into the complexities or you can read the whole report it's, it's quite hard going it's a good way to get to sleep at night um, it's in essence what we said was look in scotland we have we have a we have a process in scotland where land is brought forward for housing that is essentially speculative that is left to the landowners to decide what comes forward and what doesn't and when and so on and and in other parts of europe government in one form or another is much more active much more assertive in determining what what land is brought forward when and how for housing so it's much more directed if you like and the, the guts of our recommendations are is that and there's lots of details so don't please don't get the impression this is this is all <laughs> but the guts of it was we said look we need we need a a more planned and assertive approach to bringing land forward for housing in scotland and because I mean, one of the most telling moments in that work that I remember well was when a graph was put up by, by, by someone showing how over the last 25 years the cost of building a house had, had broadly risen in line with inflation. The cost of the land underneath that house had massively exceeded the rate of inflation, really telling. So there's something wrong with land supply. 
tax, as I indicated earlier, is potentially huge. And I think, uh, to, you know, I think there's some way to go with this. It's a difficult one, partly because a lot of tax uh, policy uh, and, and legislation is reserved to Westminster. So the Scottish government um, has really limited uh, tools here. Um, but also because you have, you know, taxes that apply to land mostly apply to other things too, and you have to be quite careful about unforeseen consequences. But we did a, a detailed piece of work, and lots of people have views on this, but, but, but the reality is that the experts told us this is, you know, a lot more complex than some people like to think. And we went abroad, and well, we didn't go abroad, but we looked at what happened abroad. Sorry, no free flights for, for land commission staff, but... Um, we looked at what had happened abroad and we learned a lot from that actually but what we did say was and, and again this is a summary of the report please read it but we said look there's a lot of value in land that perhaps we could tax further that we don't perhaps tax it um uh in quite the right way at the moment that actual value and there is you know best part of half this nation's wealth is in land so so we need to think about that but it's not it's not simple it's not a free lunch it's got to be done really carefully and secondly we said look there's a lot of tax tools you could use to actually try and influence behavior and influence land reform objectives you know for example if a piece of land is lying vacant and derelict and you said uh, we're going to introduce a tax that's targeted at vacant and derelict land that would massively incentivize people to do something with that vacant and derelict land because they've got to generate an income to pay the tax so Again, lots of detail, but a lot there. We bit on the natural capital work. It's very, very topical. Um, we're moving as fast as we can on this, but the, frankly, the land market is probably moving faster than anyone can else can. And we published a, a, a review of what's happening just recently. You may have seen it. Prices are rocketing. A lot of sales taking place off market. That means that they're never advertised as a private, private deal. Um, difficult to know exactly what's happening, and but but but. The report tells us as much as we possibly can. Um, and, and the other thing that's very obviously happening is that actually there's a relatively small amount of land coming to the market, and that is also helping to push prices. So this could be a bubble. Nobody knows, of course, as with any in financial bubble, but this could be a bubble. We're now working um, on the second part of that, which is given that there's all this money interested in buying land, to, 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 to sequester carbon or whatever else it's called. And that's an opportunity for Scotland if we can harness it. It's an opportunity if we can harness that uh, for public benefit, for to create employment, for community benefit, as, for example, wind farms pay community benefit. But it's got to be done responsibly. Absolutely must. So we, 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 we are working rapidly to spell out what that looks like. But as I say, there's, there's investors in there anyway. And if you live in the National Park, you'll certainly know that. I could name a couple of very big investors already in the National Park. So we're moving as quickly as we can. Finally, we word on, on something that we've just kicked off in the last year or two, which is that we, this, this new communications hub, or relative new communications hub called My Land Scott, is particularly aimed at young people. I raise it simply to make the point that part of our challenge, I think, you know, we can do, we, we can employ brilliant people, and we do, and we've got some very, very clever people. Uh, and we commission pieces of work from academics at leading universities, not just even in, in this country, but abroad too. The work is brilliant, but if we don't communicate it to, 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 to folk, to, to, just, just to folk in all walks of life, we'll have, we'll have, we'll have missed a trick, we'll probably, to some extent, we will have failed. So communication is hugely important. This is another aspect of it. And, and I don't know if you've ever come across any of Dan Mugabe's work. It's not all about land by any means, but um, really interesting to listen to this kind of thing and, and, and just listen to the way what to some people might seem rather dry stuff is put across in a much more human way. So I just flag that for you. Um, for people like me, you can barely deal with email and, 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 and websites. That's the email address if you want to contact us, the phone number and the website. And I'll mention again at the end the importance of, of, of please taking a note of those. Use the website and contact, contact us if you wish. But I think that's really quite enough from me. So what I'm going to do now, if I can anyway, is come out of this screen and open this up for a conversation and see if I can manage to do it.
Great, right, there we are. And, and I can now see a lot more of you, so that's super. So as I said earlier, please please follow the chat because there'll be I think, links popping up there all the time to, to areas that are being discussed. But, um, and I'll need to go into it and see what people are saying if you've started saying things already. But if you would like to offer some thoughts on what you've heard, what you haven't heard and wish you had heard, what you think we should be doing and don't think and, and we're not doing, please either type it into the chat and I'll try and pick it up and uh, or put your hand up. There's a yellow hand button somewhere on this thing. Yeah, raise hand, click on raise hand. I should be able to see your hand and we'll bring you in. And let's just, let's hear your thoughts. And I may bring in Lorne or Amish or, or, or Karen to, to, to offer thoughts as we go along. So over to you. Again, a yellow hand, so I'm going to skate through the chat thing. There we are, Thomas. And there's see, there's a face I know straight away. Goodness me, right? Thomas, over to you. Hi, Hi Andrew. Yeah. Nice, to, nice to hear your presentation. Can you um, speak up a bit, Thomas? I'm not hearing you well. Um, it's a bit muffled, but we'll try. I don't know what I can do about it. Um, one of the, I'll try and get closer to um, One of the things um, of interest to me is the whole carbon sequestration and carbon credits and, the, and almost a misunderstanding by much, of, the, much of, the, of our communities as to what actually happened. So we have a, we had a global requirement to sequest CO2 and the Scottish government offered um, grants uh, like peatland action to SNH, and that was a that was a request to the landowning fraternity to try their best to help out and do something for for the climate. So that so I don't think any landowners asked for this grant funding. It was available. People like Wildland rose to the challenge and did their best to um, you know try and help. And all of a sudden, we seem to be pigeonholed into this bad landowners who are somehow trying to rape and pillage an emerging market. And I noticed that there was a there was an article in the newspaper recently, and you and you yourself made some comments about the about the, the carbon market. And I just wondered, do you think that financial assistance for doing things like restoring peat bogs, do you think that was administered wrongly in the first place? Do you want to tell us what you think, Thomas? I, I, I'm not sure I know, I'm not that close to this, but uh, I'll come to Hamish in a second for a thought, but tell, do you, do you, you obviously chose to take the money. Um, did you think it was a good scheme, a fair scheme? Well, I actually, we chose to take 50% funding actually. Because I, I did think that if you're if you're moving into something which is um, public benefit and potentially potentially benefit to the owner, which we didn't really know in 2015, 16 when we started this. So I, I was quite surprised when there was hundred percent funding for restoring peatland and then potentially you could, you know, as, as somebody described. You get paid for mining and then you keep all the gold. I thought that was quite a good way of putting it. But it's been portrayed slightly as if it's the landowners who came up with this scheme. And it wasn't. I see Joey's looking ahead. But yeah. there's, many, there's many people seem to, to have this idea that. So, it, so I think moving into the. So that's that carbon sequestration and, and, and money for peatland. And I think there's, uh, I think it needs to be, I think I think how we got to the situation who, and who's giving the funding needs to be a really good Okay, Thomas, thank you. Um, I, I think the subject is quite a bit wider and more complex than you've maybe suggested. Um, no, no question that, um, it is reasonable to, to expect landowners to, you know, responsible landowners presumably don't allow their peat to erode and release CO2 all over the place. 
Um, so it's reasonable to expect a responsible landowner to pay for some of that. Um, uh, I think uh, I, I'm well aware that s &H, um, certainly in the short term, has been providing quite generous funding to try and get this moving because Scotland has been releasing a whole heap of CO2 out of its peatlands. And, but, the, but the wider subject of carbon capture and carbon market is, I think, much bigger. Hamish, why don't I ask you to offer some sort of bigger thoughts about this whole subject, if you wouldn't mind? Yeah, a few, a few thoughts. And I mean, I think you raised some fair questions, Thomas, and, and this is a kind of complex and rapidly developing area at the moment. So I think no, no question that the kind of land use change that you're talking about in terms of peat restoration and indeed woodland expansion is, is needed and is what the Scottish Government are looking for. Um, and of course, investment in that is welcome and needed. Um, and government's been clear that they can't pay for this all, certainly not in the long term. So yes, they're trying to get it going with public funds, but they're also trying to get private finance into it, which, which is much needed. I think the challenge comes really is people, people are getting unnerved about the pace and scale of some of the change. Um, and, and also the, financial, that, the, the financialization of, of some of the markets. Um, so I don't, think there's, I don't think there's much debate around the idea that you know, investing in peatland restoration is a good thing to do. I think what's starting to worry people is the kind of degree of speculation that we might be seeing in the land market from those that are banking on carbon values rising significantly in the future or banking on the underlying land value um, rising again. So, so again, it's, it's, it's where this market is taking us rather than the underlying land use change that I think is making people nervous at the moment. Hamish, thanks very much. I think the other aspect, Lauren, I'm going to ask you um, just a quick thought, because the other aspect of this that people talk to me a lot about is, so, um, you know, people are coming in and buying all this peatland, um, block, blocking up drains, trapping carbon, selling carbon credits, all the rest of it, doesn't create much employment because the people who do it kind of come in and go out, doesn't really do much for the kids in the school and all that kind of stuff. Just, and, and, and you know, in contrast, a wind farm, you know, pays out a chunk of wind community benefit and, you know, supports local local infrastructure and all the rest of it. Any thoughts on that, Lorna, where we might be trying to go with this? I think everything's just uh, very much in early days. I uh, uh, got an email, I'm a chartered accountant, that's the kind of day job, and I got an email today from the Institute of Chartered Accountants saying that they wanted uh, volunteers to go on our working group to uh, start to look at the taxing of the uh, carbon credits and everything associated with that. So uh, in order to put a proposal to HMRC uh, as to how best to treat uh, the taxation of uh, some of the future income streams that might come from all of this. So I, I think that is a demonstration of just how we are at very early days in all this market. And again, it's all very uh, difficult to predict. I was around at the early days of the, the various wind farms and uh, also the communities that were looking at community benefit, but also the communities that were looking at uh, taking forward renewable energy projects totally at their own hand. And it's very interesting to reflect on what happened there. Uh, in many cases, some of the uh, communities that decided to take forward or were in a, half, in a positive position that could take forward some of the uh, renewable energy projects, whether that was hydroelectric or uh, onshore wind turbines, uh, have perhaps benefited to a greater extent in terms of the income streams that accrue to the communities, rather than the bog standard kind of £5,000 per megawatt installed from community benefits. So I think we, as the Land Commission, together with others, other stakeholders, need to, to make sure that the benefits that come from uh, natural capital are distributed in a fair uh, basis as much as possible. But as I say, it's still very much at early days and we're seeing an emerging market. I think that's all I can say at this stage, eh, Andrew. Thanks. Well, thanks. So, look, it's a it's a, it's a it's a it's a big, complicated subject. John Burns in the chat makes, I think, a really important point, which is that few in the media and therefore few few people, full stop, really properly understand this subject. And I think that um, you know that's actually just reflected in that discussion we've had. It is a very difficult one. 
we I don't know if you want to say anything very briefly, Hamish, but we are, you know, we've got stakeholder workshops and things this month. We've got a lot of stuff going on, and then we will have further publications in June. But a very quick heads up on some of that. Yeah, I'll say a bit about what we're doing. So we're really kind of looking at three aspects to this. So we are looking at what's happening in the land market. Um, and we published, as Andrew said, a major report looking at the implications for the rural land market um, just last month. Uh, and on the back of that, we're putting together advice for government at the moment. Uh, and we have kind of a series of um, engagement uh, events and discussion over the coming month uh, just to, to shape that. Um, as well as the land market, we're looking particularly at response. You know, what, what does responsible practice look like in this context? Um, and again, developing a, a protocol, going back to what Andrew was saying in the presentation, um, just to try and set out as clearly as we can some basic expectations uh, around responsible practice for both ownership and investment in, in carbon and natural capital. Uh, and then the third area is, is very much on community benefit, where at this stage we're trying to understand what works and what doesn't um, in terms of how we ensure community benefit from this kind of investment. Um, and as we've touched on, there are, there are many different models and different ways that money is coming into this. Um, so over the next, well, over the coming year, we're going to be working with a number of people on the ground, just looking at real life uh, examples as they as they emerge and what works and what doesn't for delivering community benefit. Thanks, Hamish. So a really useful comment from Emma just come in, Emma Stewart, which I think um, is worth reflecting on, actually, which the point being that if this is entirely market driven, then you won't necessarily get the best design restoration um for for the sort of wider public interest aspects of this and and i'm not, not sure if this is what you meant to imply emma but what i took from it was um that uh, therefore perhaps the public money element of this needs to be targeted better uh to to focus on on good you know making sure the restoration is good quality as well as delivering the carbon credits and all the rest of it and now um, i just i can see your hand thomas i'll come back to you in a second i just um, want to say, Angus Manickel, I've, I've got your comment about controls and owns. I'm going to come back to that in a second. I just want to let the discussion about carbon run a wee bit further, but not too much, much further. Uh, Sarah is very helpful in putting up lots of links for you. So there's massive information. Thomas, Thomas I think probably a last word on this, uh, then I should move the subject, the, the discussion on. Okay. Um, it was just on Hamish's point there that um, talking, to, talking to landowners or people involved, um, we, we'd be delighted to to talk about about this with the, the land commission. We are, I mean, I'm I'm a local guy. Went to local primary school. I kind of got a bit of a foot in both camps. Um, so we'd be, I'd certainly be delighted to have a conversation offline about how this could be improved and how it could be possibly more, um, more equitable. Brilliant. Well, Thomas, um, Sarah's just put the links up on on, on these things. Uh, so please try try and participate. I, I, um, I can't just quite remember the details, but it's all in all these links. So that's great. Thanks. Thanks, Thomas. That's good. Right. I, let me come back. Uh, Angus, apologies, because you put something up earlier and I jumped straight to Carvin. <laughs> um, so a really important question, actually, which a lot of people have been grappling with for some years now, which is around discussion of who controls versus who owns. And there's two dimensions to that, because you know, some land is owned by companies, um, sometimes quite remote companies, offshore companies. And then, of course, there's the question of, well, is the control with the owner or is it with the land agent who's managing it, which is another aspect of all this. And we we work very closely with with owners. And um, I'll maybe come to Karen first, Karen, because you, you're obviously out there trying to sort of help people figure out what does what is responsible look like. Do, do you find I mean, to what extent are you finding that it's the owners you're dealing with, or is it is it somebody, you know, an agent or whatever who's who's actually making the decisions? Um, I'd say it's both, um, and uh, so we and and we work with with we work across the board with landowners and managers and um, anyone with an interest in land, and each uh, requires a different um, each. Yeah, each each is coming from their own perspective. So a lot of what we're doing is listening to the issues that people have in um, in their own uh, in relation to their own land management or their own land rights. Um, sorry, Andy, could you be could you could you clarify your question? No, no, that, that was really helpful, actually. No, that that was that was that was you know I was just looking for for, for that. No, that, that that's great. Thank you. Um, 
Uh, Angus, I'm not sure if that wholly responds to your question, but I'm jumping around this chat stream now. So if 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 if, if you want to come back, either by please please use the raise hand function and come and talk. But I, maybe that helped. I don't know. I'm going to come down to Jeremy's comment on the chat. Jeremy Roberts. So yes, lasting benefit. We're back on Pete. I don't want the whole evening to be about Pete. That would be a pity. But it is an important point that you know part of our work is to make sure that over the next sort of medium term that Scotland as a whole, the Scottish people as a whole benefit from the fact that we are, we, I mean, Scotland has extraordinary potential for carbon sequestration in particular and natural capital exploitation more generally. Um, but, but point taken, I mean, the, the, the Highlands in particular has a history of sort of flash events that bring a lot of money in and then they disappear. So point taken, absolutely. Angus, you have now got your hand up, that's wonderful. Angus, do you want to chip in please back on your subject? Um, Angus, you're muted and I can't actually see you, so I'm hoping you are there, but I can see your yellow hand. No. I'll come back to you, Angus. I can't. Oh, here you come. Better. Got you now. Yes, thank you. I... Ah, I see you. <laughs> and, and hear you. Uh, thanks, Andrew. Yeah, no, it was just in terms of a lot of the discussion tends to be focused on ownership. Um, and I remember um, way back in the days when I was at Aberdeen University studying land economy, Professor Jeremy Rowan Robinson um, telling me that ownership doesn't exist in Scotland. Um, I, and that rather what exists is a collection of rights, which he sort of described as a, a collection of sticks. And different people hold those sticks. And, and, and one of those sticks is maybe what we, we think of as, as ownership. Um, and, and I just wonder, with, with all the different layers, um, which I think you mentioned earlier on, you use the word layers um, of, of involvement in land, and which includes the public through things like planning consent and public um, responsible rights of um, a access and a, a building warrants and, 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 and all sorts of other things. Um, a, but I, I wonder if the Land Commission feels that ownership is more important than that control because it's often the control that determines the public interest rather than the ownership um if i can use that word advisedly um a, a per se great angus thank you um so we could get into quite a long philosophical discussion but the uh, of course it is when we talk about ownership we talk we use the term landowner some some people would say that's a that's a nonsense you cannot own land in, this, in the way you can you know own a book. Um, you can own certain rights, the rights to grow trees or the rights to grow barley or something. Um, and in fact, we all own Scotland's land and we all own certain rights in it. Um, and many of those, the exercise of those rights is effectively shared because we regulate the exercise of those rights. So it's effectively shared. So without getting too philosophical, I think the point you make is is a well-made one. I think what we're trying to do, and I'm going to come to you, Hamish, if you don't mind, what we're trying to do with another of our work streams is explore this whole thing more in more depth and, and ask the questions as other countries have asked. So recognizing that actually you don't own land, you, there's just there's a basket of rights there, and there's different ways and structures and mechanisms which those rights can be managed and, and shared and owned and exercised. It is the model that Scotland currently adopts where predominantly someone has most of the rights or are there not better multi-layered or flexible models of ownership and governance? So Hamish, are we word on that? I know that it's early days and that works, we'll be publishing in due course, but are we word on that work would be helpful. Yeah, and I think that's why we we often actually talk about governance rather than ownership. And it's it's a it becomes a bit of a geeky term, unfortunately, but it, but actually it's, it's more meaningful than ownership in some ways. Um, for, for precisely the reasons you've outlined, Angus. Um, so we, we do see huge potential for a much more mixed uh, sort of sharing of land rights. Um, and, and as Andrew's hinted, when we've looked at other European countries, this is quite normal. We're, we're quite unusual actually in having a really kind of siloed distinction between private ownership or community ownership or public ownership, um, or indeed NGO ownership. Those are all seen as quite separate sectors um, in Scotland sometimes. Uh, and actually what you find in many countries is that those are much more mixed, uh, much more collaborative, joint, uh, shared uh, ventures. We're starting to see that to some extent in Scotland. Um, 
Uh, and I think actually um, the, the kind of issues we've talked about with the new green finance and private finance emerging, if anything, open up more opportunities for that kind of mixed ownership model, uh, where it's quite clear that different parties are looking for different things out of, out of one area of land. Uh, and actually we, we could and should be able to develop shared governance and shared ownership models uh, on that basis. So I think there's, there is a lot of potential and it's certainly something that we are increasingly kind of working in, looking to work in practice with and, and finding examples and ways to take that forward on the ground. Thanks, Amish. So that's work in progress. Um, please watch this space. And, and it is one of one of the things we said from day one is that we must not reinvent wheels. The Land, Land Commission is not in the business of reinventing wheels. So we are looking very hard at what other countries do and what works for others and indeed what doesn't work for others, actually. Um, so that is important work. Right. I'm going to move on watching the time. Jeremy, thanks for the clarification. So Jeremy's just made the point that he does believe there are benefits beyond that initial phase. Um, and clearly, cl clearly there could be. Um, the, 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 nobody could argue that there isn't the potential for long-term benefits in all of this. I guess what some folk are worrying about is just the, how, how do we go about it, and part of our work is, is mapping some of that. I'd like to move on to the next point raised. You're going to forgive me, I don't know how to pronounce your name, but U-W-E, I'm just going to say U-E, unless um, that's not correct. You'll have to raise your hand and give me a row. Um, but I think the point you're raising is a really important one, and I always raise this hand. Right, go for it. You can make your point in person. Go for it. Hi, Andrew. It's Uwe. Uwe, right. Think of a duvet without a duh. <laughs> okay. This way to remember it. Um, yeah, the point that I'm making is that I work for RSPB Abernethy, and we have been working with the community quite closely over the last uh, three years and trying to bring them in a lot more and work with them in partnership. And what I notice, I come originally from Germany, although it's a long time ago, it's 1988 I moved here. But uh, compared to communities, and I come from a rural community in Germany, communities here seem to me to be somewhat ill-equipped, looking at the capacities they have, the skills they have, but also the governance that they have through community councils. Uh, to actually make use of the new rights and the new responsibilities that are actually coming their way through land reform. Uh, and I'm, I'm, you know, that is a bit of a blocker in a way for us to work with communities, because if we offer them more responsibility and more right to influence what we do, they almost shy away. It's almost a bit of a threat to them sometimes. So I was just wondering, um, how that's going to pan out, if that's given some thought um, and where this is going to go, you think? Well, yeah, and apologies for getting for not uh, getting your pronunciation correct. But look, this is a really important point. Um, and I think I'm actually going to come to Lorne, who will probably disagree with you quite strongly. But let me just frame it before I pass it to Lorne. I can't see your picture, Lorne. You must be there. Some oh, yes, there you are. Um, but, Look, Scotland is not a uniform place. Go out to the Western Isles, 70% of the land is entirely owned and controlled by communities. So no one can say that they don't know what they're doing. They're doing extraordinary things um, out, out there. Um, a stone's throw from where I am sitting right now, which is just outside Inverness, there's a community that's building a whole heap of affordable houses that they will own and they will rent. So that's um, they're not short of capacity. So it's a it's a it's a varied feast. But, but Lauren, can you unpick some of that? Why why is it that some communities seem to struggle and some don't? Well, I think it's a fair point that's been raised by UV uh, there. Uh, I think in my experience, I remember I was involved with the first community buyout back in 1993, and I think things have come on uh, in great leaps and bounds since then. Um, Maybe coming back to your point, Uwe, there, community councils, the actual structure there where there is no limited liability has not always been the kind of governance structure that has been taken forward for communities to be involved in ownership of land and buildings. But I've also seen that many of the organisations that have taken on perhaps a, a states, large estates in ownership, have started small with smaller projects and built up a kind of a level of skill and an understanding of how to own and manage a uh, property. So I, I think there are a lot of uh, support mechanisms out there. 
Development Trust Association Scotland gives a lot of support to organisations. We're obviously tonight meeting uh, with the Cairn Gorms area, which is uh, a large part of it is under the Highlands and Islands Enterprise area. And there's a lot of support uh, mechanisms in place. They have development officers in a lot of the areas there that can come and uh, help. And, and the other uh, source of help is that uh, the National Lottery in conjunction with Highlands and Islands Enterprise as a series of advisors throughout the whole of Scotland, the entire Scottish uh, uh, country, uh, that can offer support if a community is interested in taking forward a proposal that might look for Scottish land fund uh, support, but might look to other funding uh, to take forward a proposal and can give some help with the feasibility study, some of the development process, so can hopefully uh, give a body of evidence so the wider community can decide whether this is a, a viable, sustainable uh, project proposal that can be taken forward in the long term. So I think we can be very positive. I'm going myself along uh, on tomorrow and Saturday to the Community Land Scotland conference and uh, the, the gathering there has increased a year by year, fair enough, they haven't met for a couple of years because of COVID, but there's now over 600,000 acres in community ownership. So there is a body of expertise. And of course, one of the key aspects of that is networking amongst communities who have done it before. And sometimes that's the best way to get advice and support to take forward your own community's project. So maybe just leave it there and pass back to Andrew. Well, thanks. Let's just explore this a little bit further and see if anyone else on the call wants to say something. It is a, you know, it's clearly it's clearly a varied business. You know, you travel around Scotland and you find communities that are doing extraordinary things with land and buildings. You, know, you go down to Aberfeldy, they've they've bought and restored this extraordinary cinema in the middle of the town. Um, you, you go down to Fort Rose near me and they've bought the public toilets and turned turn, turn them into really excellent public toilets. You go to um, Near Pit Lockery, they bought a bridge to fix and, and bought a bridge that could cross the river. Um, you go down to to to, to um, uh, yeah, sorry, I've forgotten the name of the place, but a, a, an area of Edinburgh where they bought you know a massive church and turned it into the most extraordinary place. There's all sorts of things happening. It's not just out in the Western Isles at all. Um, but there are, <laughs> I mean, I've been interested to know. I, I'm not sure if you're saying of a. The King Gorms is particularly has been particularly slow off the mark on community ownership, or or or, or what? I'm not sure what. I don't even know if that's true, but um, it is an oddity. It'd be interesting to know how people how people see this because it is an oddity that different places seem to either be good or bad at this, and it isn't just about you know. You know, sometimes people say, "Well, of course, that's a very wealthy neighbourhood," but it doesn't. That's not the whole story because, you know, south of Scotland is very slow off the market. It's a very, very wealthy bit of the country. Uva, do you want to come back? You you raised it. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Just to say that I, I wasn't trying to criticise communities first of all, and I also wasn't trying to make a point about Cairngorms in particular. It's just my current experience is with the Cairngorms community, who is actually doing really well but I see the what they struggle with and the point is is more the one that I was trying to make in the chat you know I was I was very close to the Asin buyout and also to uh, the egg uh, buyout when it happened and in both of them it felt that there were very there were the right individuals with a lot of drive at the right place in the right community to make these things happen now that's fine for that community, but you know, if you look at it politically over the whole of Scotland, these things should happen fairly and it should not be dependent on who lives in your, happens to live in your community. That's why I'm asking for uh, capacity building and why I'm asking for governance mechanisms, which, which levels the playing field, or at least they could. Okay, that's really helpful, good thought. And it is clearly, that the, the more we say to communities, you know, take your destiny in your own hands and go for it, you then risk inequality because not everyone will do it. And that's the point that I think Morag is, Morag, thanks for your point in the chat, um, making a point about um, apathy, but also lack of awareness of legislation, which, which Hamish, I think we would agree that communication is, a, you know, we've invested heavily in communication to try and raise awareness. And um, so Morag, thanks for that. Um, I, I've 
got a point from Jeremy, but I want to just let Richard, Richard Webster, you've got your hand up and I apologize, I've held you back. I wasn't quite sure if it was the same subject or something else, but why don't you come in? I I would just say, I, I wonder about the, the makeup of our uh, communities. Are they, are they complex enough? I mean, what, what I'm trying to say, I think, is that many of the people I've met over the last year, 50 years of, of being in King Uzi is that many of the people here or who are coming here like it the way it is. They like emptiness, they like a lack of development. And it seems to me that particularly in recent years, wandering about seeing these desolated uh, communities um, on nearly all the estates, one wonders with um, the requirements for um, economic development aren't what they were 100 years ago. There's no need for material. Um, there's need for clean air, for water, for transport links. Um, why has it not been the case that that government, central government or local government can drive experimental projects and land ownership and reconstituting um, communities that were either cleared or were abandoned because of the lack of economic viability. I, I just feel that maybe our current communities aren't diverse enough. Um, the retired uh, wealthy uh, do a lot in, say, a community like uh, King Uzi. They're comfortably retired are, are fine. Um, the tradespeople do very well because of the, the holiday house, the, the situation. The tourism, tourism need not necessarily be as central to the highland economy as what everyone seems to just accept as the key. Our community is not diverse. We're looking for biodiversity, but I think we should be thinking of human diversity, which we don't make much progress on. Richard, thanks very much indeed. Um, I'm going to come back to that if you don't mind. Uh, so I'll put Lorne on notice that we're going to talk about repeopling in a wee while. That's okay. But um, I just want to come back to something that Jeremy put in the chat. Sorry, Jeremy, uh, you put this in a while ago. It's just me trying to keep up. It's not quite, quite difficult, this. But you, you put a point in the chat, which I... Um, uh, you were talking about uh, delivery of ecosystem services and so on, and what's the role of the Land Commission. So, uh, and as I tried to explain in the, in the, in the um, preamble, we are putting a lot of resource into trying to, if you like, to write the script for what responsible looks like. And rather than try and just answer your question directly, I thought I'd ask Karen to just say a bit about that whole programme. Would you? I mean, to just just outline it and um, what, what, what it's all trying trying to do yeah so um so based on the land rights and responsibilities statement and the principles of that um as as jeremy knows there's there's the protocols that um that there's there's protocols uh, to give guidance on delivering on each of the principles and that's on issues like um community engagement, increasing collabor collaboration with community, diversification of ownership and tenure, good stewardship and everything that that means, that's a broad topic. Um, and it's all based on a framework of human rights. Um, so, so what the commission is trying to do and what the good practice team within the commission is trying to do is, 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 um, is, 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 is to, to work for culture change, um, the trajectory, it kind, it kind of alludes to what Richard and Uwe were saying as well. There's the trajectory of land reform in Scotland has been to try to empower communities increasingly to take an active role in um, decision decision making, or at least having a voice on on how land is used and managed around um, them. And that, but there's no shortcut to that. So. As you, as people were saying, um, communities need capacity building, and um, there's there needs to be a sort of step by step um, 
and and this and there's so many different people working on so many different levels and that culture change takes the kind of cooperation of all of all of those different um organizations and uh, community groups um yeah no i think that's that, that's pretty helpful karen um sarah has just put up uh, a link to the good practice program which i hope people will also find helpful um it doesn't i didn't answer we're not answering answering your question straight in a way jeremy but you know it is not our job to take over from nature scott or the council or the national park authority or anybody else and they're far far bigger than us and they often have quite localized teams of staff who can do things on the ground well like yourself actually um to do stuff on the ground in contrast we're a tiny wee thing covering the entire country and we need we need to stay fairly strategic and um, but we are i think it's fair to say lauren that that we are the board is very clear that alongside intensive work to advise government on legislative and policy change there will be a land reform bill next year and so on alongside that writing a pretty comprehensive script for owners of land rights which spells out what responsible looks like what is expected by the people of scotland and that will evolve of course but spelling it out can only help you i think jeremy actually in terms of what you're what you're talking about i hope so Lauren, let's have a wee chat about repeopling because it's a really interesting subject. So we hear a lot about rewilding. Um, I go walking in the National Park, hill walking. I also just go out with the tent for two or three days uh, into some parts. And there are bits in the National Park where there used to be quite sizable communities and they're now completely deserted. Uh, and you can see the ruins. And you come out, came across an old um, uh, grain jar a few weeks ago, Miles Moon. Okay, thanks for that, uh, Andrew. Uh, maybe addressing Richard's point there, this is very topical, the, the subject of repopulation. And indeed, uh, tomorrow, it's not the Scottish Land Commission, but again, referring to Community Land Scotland, is actually live streaming a discussion and debate on repopulation. So perhaps if you wanted to find out more information on that topic, uh, I think there's about... Uh, a large number, was it 40 or 50 people coming together to discuss that tomorrow, you could go onto the Community Land Scotland website and, and just get a link to the live streaming. Um, but I think it's fair to say that much of the impetus in the past uh, for people to look at the possibility of land ownership by a community has been triggered by perhaps negative experiences, if you're looking back to the egg and some of the original uh, buyouts there. So in, in some of the modern day communities there, the, there isn't the impetus that there was perhaps. Um, but having said that, I think what I am seeing evolving is that uh, in the early days, many of the communities look to take ownership of an entire estate because that was the only option that was open to them. Whereas in the current day, many communities are interested in smaller portions of land, perhaps the land that surrounds their village or the land that surrounds their town. And they're looking at land for housing, for community development, maybe for a play park, for various other facilities like workshops for business development but are not necessarily, and why should they wish to take on necessarily the large estate uh, when it is only part of the land that they are particularly interested in? So I think you will see that evolving. And the reference earlier about hybrid governance models, I know we are kicking off much of our work on diversification of land ownership. And integral to that is looking at hybrid governance, ownership structures that might bring communities, but also maybe major NGOs and perhaps private individuals together to look at the purchase perhaps of an estate. And, and we may be looking at aspects, different aspects or portions of that estate going to different forms of ownership. So it is an interesting time. 
Um, but I think your point about repopulation is well made, particularly with the demographics that we are seeing in uh, our rural areas, uh, where the there is an imbalance emerging between a young population and perhaps a non-economically active older population. And I think we need to address that uh, pr pretty soon. So I'll just leave it at that and pass back to Andrew. Well, thanks very much indeed. I'm just going to go on to Sandy in a minute. Just, just Can I just add one quick thing to what Lorne said, which is um, big chunks of the park are in the Crofton counties uh, or adjacent to the Crofton counties. Legislation does allow the creation of new crofts. It's not much talked about, but there's huge potential there for landowners in the National Park to create new crofts and, and thereby create opportunities for young people as well worth thinking about. Now, Sandy McDonnell, you've got your hand up and have done for a wee while. Apologies for keeping you waiting. Over to you. That's OK. Uh, I just wanted to uh, pick up on Dick, uh, Dick's point uh, and, and, um, and um, also the point just from Lauren there, just about depopulation. Um, I worked across the Highlands for 30 years, just in the police and various, various communities. So I have an understanding of how the people uh, kind of live and work in these and I was kind of and I've been brought up in, in estates and small in small thing one of the thing is that the whole thing is joined up so it can't be just the big landowner and the small owners the kind of depopulation of the highlands is really through the fact that prices are are basically so high that people can't live here um, so they've got to move and once they move, there is no work and they're not going to generate that work. Uh, the people who come in here are basically retired um, and they bring money, but they do not want to have pubs. They do not want to have things that's going to cause them a disturbance. And they also really don't generate a very much money that will keep something going. So you've got to have um, you've got to have something that joins it all up. One of the things I noticed when I worked up in Sutherland and places like that in the, on, on the West Coast is that every little bit is important. So, so you might have an estate and one person is employed by them. They have a small, a small amount, uh, they can have a, um, they, uh, um, um, I, so they may have a small wage coming from there. But when you had the bank, when you had the police station, when you had the district nurse, all that feeds in. And um, these people also had families. And that whole sort of economic uh, group, that's basically gone. And there needs to be, I'm not quite sure how you do it, but there needs to be some thought how that can be replaced. Because if you do take away the big landowners and you give all that land away to someone else, one of the things about the big landowners is they did have the money to actually run it. And you can see it sometimes when other organizations come in, um, um, uh, um, you know, a, a, say if they can be private charities, they'll buy something, but it's actually volunteers that actually run most of it. And they don't put money into it. You, you know, they, they don't put any money in, they don't put people in the schools. And that is really just a general point. You know, the other thing I want to pick up from earlier when you're when you're talking about the various rights and responsibilities and legislation is that so many times um, we see that it actually gets entrenched. Um, you try everyone tries very hard just to get it right, but there must be some, but there must be, um, but there must be something put in right at the start that you know that if that doesn't work that can be changed very quickly uh, because if not, it gets entrenched and it carries on and carries on and it's never fixed. Uh, and that's basically my, my, my points. Sandy, thank you very much indeed. Um, all these things kind of link together. That's pretty helpful. Um, Hamish, I'm going to come back to you, if, if you don't mind, um, on this, this sort of... So, so yeah, th this... It's, and, and let's try and focus it in on the National Park, which you do know fairly well. There clearly are particular characteristics of the National Park that are perhaps worth just reflecting on here. You know, if you look in the chat here, a number of people, John Burns and, and, and before him, Duncan, you know, talking about recreating small communities and so on. Um, we've talked at some length earlier about 
you know, relatively small amount of community activity in the park compared with some other parts of Scotland anyway. I, I mean, community ownership type of based activity. Um, did, and, and perhaps as, as Sandy uh, Im, implied uh, and Richard before him, a, a community that is perhaps older, more retired, more comfortable, I don't know. But what, what are the sort of catalysts that, 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 I'm not sure what I'm asking you here, Hamish, but... What, why don't I why don't I pick up on some of the comments in the chat, Andrew, and just um, just because uh, I think there's some some useful points made there, you know, about the sparsely populated and, and kind of re-establishing communities, and and I suppose I'll link that to to housing, which is is probably at the heart of that, um, and and this in some ways is the you know the practical implementation of what repeopling is about is how do, how do we actually increase housing, um, because that that is fundamentally what kind of underpins communities getting young people into the area. You know, able to carry out, able to undertake the jobs uh, that people are looking for, etc. So, a couple of comments there about kind of rights to buy, and you know, should there be more radical or, or dramatic rights to buy? There are actually already quite a few rights to buy in existence. Um, so there is a community right to buy in terms of communities wanting to register right to, to acquire land when it comes up for sale. There is a more recent um, sustainable development right to buy, which actually gives a community the right to acquire a bit of land. Uh, if they if, if there's clear adverse impacts and the community has a proposal for making much better use of that land in the public interest now that hasn't been tested yet uh, and that's probably because it sets quite a high bar um, but there is uh, a theoretical right to buy there but actually what those tell us are that kind of negotiated transfers and, and acquisitions are probably far more likely to to come into play and be in practice and if we think about this in housing one of the things we recommended when we looked at the housing market um, last year was that particularly in areas like this, each rural community should have a long-term housing land supply that is in either community or public control. Um, and it can come into there by, by various means, either by rights to buy or more likely by negotiated and kind of long-term land acquisition um, at, at lower land values if you're looking 10 to 20 years ahead. Um, but I think that kind of approach, and, and again, in the Cairngorms, you know, I, you've got a, a planning authority in a national park context here that provides a bit more support to allow that kind of approach to come into play. We've seen some good examples like the Rothy Marcus housing, for example, um, uh, and, and kind of new innovative approaches to, to getting small groups of new housing uh, coming into play both here and elsewhere in the Highlands. Uh, and I think that's, you know, that's got real potential in terms of getting that long-term land supply into community and public um, control so that communities are able to take the lead um, in creating that housing. Great, thanks, Hamish. Um, conscious about 10 minutes left, but I, and I would like to hear from anyone who hasn't had a chance yet, if anyone wants to, to press the uh, raise hand button. There are probably subjects that we haven't covered that you'd like to cover, or you just want to chip in, just chip in. Anyone want to have a go? No. Okay, well, that's fine. Well, look, um, I'm going to start to wrap it up then. Uh, um, that, that, frankly, that's been quite interesting as to what it is you wanted to focus on is, is, is always interesting because different parts of Scotland will always focus on different things. I think in a way, just to try and wrap it up, um, I'm just going to ask Karen, Lorne and Hamish just to just to reflect for two or three minutes on, 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 what, on, on what they've heard and, and sort of link that to their wider experience around the country. It might be helpful. And um, Lauren, why don't I ask you to sort of start that? Just, just you know, what, what, what uh, any reflections on what you've heard? So I've, I've found this most interesting. I, I suppose uh, I'm just uh, trying to scan the chat there, and the last comment there was from John Burns, just talking about repopulating historic cleared hamlets, maybe take some of the pressure off hotspots such as Abbey Moor. And I think that's an interesting proposal. Uh, and I think what we're talking about there is perhaps acquisition by a public body or by a community of land that would allow for that to be taken forward. And there's an interesting uh, concept that's sort of coming forward. At the moment, many of the community, well, really all of them, the community right to buy need uh, a community resident to take that forward. But many are suggesting that we need to move that uh, forward a bit and look at the resettlement of previous uh, areas 
that were once settlements. And in that respect, we maybe need to open the, the kind of barriers that are there that prevent a, 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 an area coming forward to look to community ownership or whatever that doesn't have a resident community. And, uh, and that's something that I think we can explore because we really do need to take some of the pressure off some of the local hotspots. But thank you very much. I found this most interesting. And as you have said, Andrew, it is interesting as we move around the country that there are different issues that come to the forefront. So it's always a, a learning experience for us all and it's good, good to listen. Thanks for that, Andrew. Well, and thanks very much indeed. And um, before I come to Karen, I'm going to let Thomas. Thomas McDonnell has got his hand up again. So let's hear from Thomas again. Something's, something's bobbed up in your head, Thomas. You're muted at the moment. Yeah, sorry about that. It was just the last point about um, cleared communities. I, I don't necessarily think that going into remote people stayed in remote areas or were they remote Not, maybe they weren't at the time but some of the areas that people used to stay in was because they were black cattle was selling them at creef and the napoleonic cessation of the napoleonic wars etc you know the, the whole need for for leather and things changed so I'm, I'm not so sure that people's economic activity is different now and the planning the planning laws suggest that rather than moving into the into the environment that we actually try and build around communities. So I support the ethos of what was said, but I don't actually agree that targeting some communities from the 1820s where there used to be hamlets of people, um, 10 people, 10 kids living in one tiny little house, and you got probably accused of child abuse if you did that today. I don't think that that kind of model is a, is a great way to go. I think that, yes, the ethos of expanding communities, making more land available is good, but I wouldn't necessarily be led trying to trying to repopulate things from the 1820. Well, thanks. It's certainly a helpful piece of pragmatism, uh, which is what I would expect from you, Thomas. Thanks very much indeed. Um, and, and a useful, you know, I, I, absolutely. I think any kind of naive view that we just turn the clock back is, is, is certainly not going to come from us anyway. Um, great. Karen, you're up, just any reflections on what you've heard and perhaps relate it back to, to what you do on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, well, it's been really interesting to just sort of follow the thread of the conversation and see, well, for me, there's sort of three main strands of what, what has come out of the um, discussion. First, housing is no, no surprise that that's a really pressing issue for people and, and, and it's very connected to the next, which is, governance models and how can different approaches that are not about community ownership also help enable communities to meet their needs um, and then and then what people were raising about community capacity capacity building if opportunities do arise what do communities need to be able to step into those needs whether they're funding opportunities or partnership opportunities um, in relation to that um, the good practice team does run uh, a, a sort of training schedule or a, or information sessions, um, and and we have sort of we've got some sessions in Cairngorm National Park, online sessions, just short sessions, about forty five minutes, penciled in for later this year. So I would be really keen to hear from anyone who wants to suggest topics uh, for those sessions that they feel would be of particular interest. I'm gonna definitely take away from this meeting um, those kind of themes uh, to see what we can work up so we could uh, fully um, run run uh, one or two events that could be um, useful on, to add to that discussion. Great, Karen, thank you very much indeed. I, I, and, and absolutely to echo that. And the reason for having these public meetings is because Scotland is a diverse country and we, we are doing our best as a wee national body to reflect that diversity in the way we think and work. Hamish, last sort of word to you before I wrap it up on just what you've heard, any reflections? Yeah, I think one of the other big themes we've talked about is land use uh, and changing land use in particular. So I think I, I'll, I'll just, just reflect that in many ways, a lot of our work and, and actually what a lot of land reform is about is, is about setting the right framework for making those decisions. Um, 
land use objectives will change all the time and, and whatever the specific objectives are, um, a lot of our work is about how those decisions are made in a way that's seen as fair, you know, accountable, um, productive and, and in which the benefits are shared. So it is very much about the balance of public and private interests, uh, whatever the individual specific objectives, which which will change over time. Anyway, thanks a lot. OK, well, there's just two or three minutes left um, and no hands waving. So I'm going to thank you all very much indeed. Just um, a couple of thoughts from me, if you don't mind. I mean, the, 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 the first is, I, like, like all of these meetings, one of the things that stands out from this meeting is 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 that Scotland is a diverse country. If we'd been if we'd been doing this for borders or if we'd been doing it for Argyle, it would have been a very different meeting. And I think that tells you a lot. Um, so and that underlines, I think, the value of um, of doing this for the Land Commission. And it does really help help us. Um, Please don't go away from this meeting thinking that land reform is something that somebody else does or something that the Land Commission does and you can just go, go on with your lives. Land Commission, land reform, if it's going to work in Scotland, has, has to be something that's, that's not just driven by the people, but actually that the people do it. So, you know, all the talk about community empowerment, community in, in, um, ownership and so on, that's all part of a, a land reform picture and, and I would I would encourage you to to take away from this as we will take away from it some sort of provocative thoughts about so how do what what is it we want to achieve in the national park in land reform terms and how are we going to achieve it and who's going to do it and all and, and, and so on and so forth um lots of ideas being bobbed up and I'd ha I have to say lots mostly people have been focusing on opportunities not challenges and that's a really positive thing about the park um, there is uh, our website is now a huge resource. Um, there's 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 now five or six years worth of work on that website, so please use it if you can't uh, remember what it is. Um, just Google Scottish Land Commission and you'll find it. There's also an email address which is info at Land Commission Gov Scott. Um, so you can contact us again. That's on the website. You don't need to remember it. So you can contact us, and in fact, there's a phone number too. And I would just say. In the old days when we had public meetings in village halls and so on, one of the best parts of the meetings um, was after everyone had well, the meeting had closed and then people come sidling up to me and say, well, I didn't want to say this in the meeting, but I want to tell you this. Um, so if you want to do that, please get onto the email thing, um, email it. And if you would like to either email it to me, that'd be lovely. But if you want me to give you a ring, well, actually, Sarah's put the phone number up there in the chat. But if you want me to give you a ring, and talk to you privately, and I promise it will be privately. Send in an email, give me your name and your number, and I'll get back to you. Um, uh, that's you know, it's the only way I can do it uh, with, uh, on, on this format. There is also um, uh, regular blogs, regular newsletters, and all the rest of it. So please also, you know, um, there's a bit on the website where you can register to get newsletters and all that kind of thing. You can follow us on Twitter and Facebook and all these sorts of things as well. So plenty of ways in which you can keep track of what we're up to. But I do stress, um, we will be also very interested to know what you are up to. So thank you all for joining us. It is now just about half past eight. So have a very safe journey to your um, your kettle or your drinks cupboard or wherever you're off to. Uh, and uh, I look forward to seeing you again next time that we hold one of these meetings in the Kingdoms, if not before. Good night all. Thank you. <laughs>